from the campus of the Jimmy Swaggart Bible College in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, we're happy to present to you this JSBC chapel service. Join with us as we come together in a time of praise, worship, and ministering of the Word of God. This is a week of prayer and fasting, and I know that some of you are praying and fasting. The chapel is open, so even if you have a class, you can come back into the chapel and make this a place of prayer. All this week is a, a time of prayer and fasting, so if you go out, you can come back in. But let's just open our hearts now. This man we all love. We all love Brother Greenaway. He's very, very special to me as a person, and I know he has endeared himself to your heart. Let's welcome Brother Greenaway. Amen. Give me that. Somebody put ice in there. Amen. Somebody put ice in that water. Did you ever try to preach with a nice cube in your mouth? You know, when I started out to preach, they at least gave you a mason fruit jar. Now they give you this stuff. I was preaching one morning some time ago and grabbed one of these, and I baptized everybody on the front row. Well, it's a great day to be alive. If you're alive. Don't lie to me. You lie to some of these other boys, but don't you try to lie to me. Because God will show me. You know, one of the things we've lost through the generations of Pentecost is discernment. Is actual, honest to God, discernment. I remember one day walking down the hospital corridor with my father-in-law, who preached 67 years. He bought a tent when he was 89. And some of you mavericks are thinking about quitting. Quit. But I tell you what, the kingdom of God will roll on. Your greatest years is not your history. It's your future. And the one who has led his church for 2,000 years is not about to quit. Walking down the hospital quarter with my father-in-law, he was something else. If you think that you have seen anointing, somebody said to me when I came on the platform this, this, this morning that they said, Brother Greenaway, among all the things you've learned in 53 years, you've never learned to preach 30 minutes. <laughs> I wanted to tell him that you can teach an idiot to preach 30 minutes. You can teach an idiot to preach 15 minutes if he's preaching sermon. But you get the anointing on you, you have a hard time turning it off. Amen. You can preach 30 minutes without an anointing. And watch the clock. Turn it off. If that's Pentecost, I'm Chinese. Walking down the hospital corridor with my father-in-law, we passed the door and a young man in the room in bed motioned us for us to come in. So we went in and my father-in-law pre prayed for more people that were healed. He cast out more devils than some of you will ever see. And the strange part of it was the man had never been to a seminar on healing. 
had never even read Charles S. Price's book on principles of faith. Hey, God just saved him, filled him with the Holy Ghost, called him to preach, and that's what he did. He wasn't dumb. You'll never get smart enough to heal anybody. You'll never get smart enough to save anybody. He heals and he saves. So we went in the room and the, the my daddy-in-law said, what's your trouble, son? Well, the kid lied. That's always good when you for a starter with, with the man of God. He lied to him. He said, well, he was this and that and something else. So my father-in-law prayed a little prayer and walked out. I'd never seen him do that. Walking down the corridor with him, he said to me, he, I said, Dad, that wasn't much of a prayer. Ah, he said, you don't waste your time on liars. I said, what are you saying? He said, you don't waste your time on liars. He said, he lied to me. So we went on, and about a half hour later, I was walking back down the corridor. My father-in-law went on to town, and I was walking back down the corridor, and that kid called me in again. He said, close the door. I closed the door. And my father-in-law said to me, he said, now, son, I'll tell you what the boy's trouble is. He said he's having his trouble with his wife. Now, he didn't know the kid at all. He said he's having trouble with his wife, and he has <laughs> raised so much cane, she's getting ready to leave him, and it's knocked him for a loop. When I closed the door, that kid said to me, he said, he said, I lied. I said, the old man knew you lied. He said, I didn't tell him the truth. I said, he knew that. He said, my problem is my wife's getting ready to leave me. I said, if you'd have told the old man the truth, he'd have helped you. And you always tell God the truth. Amen? He'll chase you all over the hill, and he'll get you. Your superintendent may not get you, but God will get you. I remember when, when we were boys growing up, and my mother, God bless her memory, would can 600, 700,000 jars of fruit every year and vegetables, and then... My brother and I would spend the fall carrying that stuff in a bushel basket between us to the hungry and the needy. We were poor. Dear God, we were poor. And I used to get embarrassed going down the street with those jars. And I said to my brother one day, I said, Bill, let's chuck this in the next gutter. Bill said, I would, Charlie. But he said, I'll tell you what, he said, God would tell mom what we did. <laughs> He'll get you. I started to say the thing that we lack today is good old-fashioned backwoods gingham calico Holy Ghost discernment. Amen? which would settle half of our problems. When I went to counseling sessions, or I never went to counseling sessions, but because we never had any, really. When you went into those older men of God, man, you didn't tell them what your problem was. They told you and said, God will get you. You didn't go to the church office because we didn't have any office. Our educational building was nine curtains pulled each way. 
You went to the pastor's house. You didn't have a telephone, so you couldn't bug him by telephone. Thank God. Some woman called me one night and said, Brother Greenaway, you got to get me straight on the raptures. I said, get ready for the first one. <laughs> get ready for the first one. You went to the pastor's house. I remember when I got licensed to preach. I went in before men like Robert Brown, J.R. Flowers, Daddy Tunmore, Flem Van Meter, David McDowell, the prince of preachers. We didn't fill out any forms. They told you when you were ready. You didn't tell them. And I walked in and just stood there and bawled. You know what else to do? <laughs> and the beautiful part of it was, they bawled with me. I don't know why we were bawling. So you went to the pastor's house and you, you walked in and you said, Oh man, I got me a problem. I've thought of that the last three weeks. I've seen more people with problems. Why do you always come to me? <laughs> what are you ringing my phone off the hook for? Central's never busy, always on the line. You may talk to heaven anytime. Tis a royal service. What is it? Free for one and all. And you, what, get your answer through the royal telephone. <laughs> Go to him. Amen. Amen? If he doesn't have it, it's not there. <laughs> hey, hey, tell me about it. Go to him. So you went in and you said, Pastor, I got me a problem. He always said, hey, I know you got a problem. And he tell you what it was. He said, I know what your problem is. You're full of the devil. Get on your knees and repent. <laughs> God will help you. Next case. <laughs> Discernment. Solomon only asked God for two things. For an understanding heart and the right to know good from evil. That is nothing but discernment. And if we have discernment, as I started to say, you're halfway home. Our problem is we're always looking to somebody else. And we have forgotten the source. Amen? These lights here, they all have a powerhouse somewhere. These lights are beautiful. But if somebody shuts the power off, or the lines are cut, then we're in trouble. It's not these lights. And you and I, we are not the light. You hear me? You are not God. The day I learned that, it helped me. You are not the Lord of the harvest. You are not even in management. You are only in sales. That's all you're in. You are not the light. You are only the reflection of the light. Let me read you something. Some years ago, 
Now, this is the only time I will have to address you, so I'm going to tell you about it. You've heard all the great preachers. <laughs> now you're looking at survival. <laughs> Amen? You're looking at 53 years of honest-to-God survival. I've been through all kinds of storms. I have been through persecution, sickness, pain, heartache, been kicked around, stomped on, left for dead. <laughs> I died. <laughs> I'm not talking to you about theory. I'm talking to you about a life that I've lived up to now, 53 years, and I'm like the Apostle Paul, none of these things move me. My feet are on the ground, my head is screwed on tight, and I'm going to make it. Amen, because I belong to the only thing that what? Going to make it. A number of years ago, I wrote a poem. You didn't know I was a poet, did you? Well, I've written a number of them. At that time, I was the field director for Eurasia with 300 missionaries. I made every one of them write the same poem. I had the art department make up for me 300 pieces of poetry paper. And I had five lines on there. Then I left four or five lines. And each line started with, if I should quit. I said to every one of my missionaries, you write a poem, if I should quit. I have 300 of them. And I've got 300 different reasons why you don't quit. Amen? Hey, 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 I'm not going to quit because he didn't quit. When he walks out, I'll walk out. You, shall I read this? It's entitled, If I Should Quit. If I should quit, what would the gain be? Would, I, would the battle be lost? Would I really be free? No, the door would not close nor the battle cease because God would have another to stand in the breach if I quit. If I should quit, what would I do? Seek shelter from the heat? Forget the cry of the lost? Would I be happy for a time and then find I was through and spend my time praying for something to do, saying, God, why did I quit? If I should quit, I would find that God had not. The battle would still rage, the church would march on, the wind would keep blowing, the spirit in filling, only I would be further and further behind, unwilling, wondering, God, why did I quit? If I should quit, what could I say to God who called me? And the people who sent me, and the pagan who trusted me to show him the way, and to the spirits urging day after day, God, I can't quit. If I should quit, let it be when I am D-E-A-D, -E dead. Not while I'm alive, nor when I'm dissatisfied, nor when I'm criticized or minimized or ostracized, but please, God, let quitting time be for me when I'm dead. So there you have it. If you want to quit, come and read it.
We're living in a day of examination. Your generation is the great, greatest examiners that history's ever seen. You examine everything. You're the most inquisitive bunch God's ever seen. Why? 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 Every time I see one of you coming, I see a big sign around your neck. Why? Why? I don't know why, but he does. Go to him. Why? Religion in every phase is being examined. Life is being examined. I didn't know there was so much to examine as this generation examines. They, the problem is they don't examine themselves. They're always examining somebody else. Because if you spend enough time examining yourself, you'll be ahead. Everything is being questioned. Why? Why? Little kids. I was in a church recently on Sunday morning. There was a little kid, five and a half years old, on the front seat. He had a big piece of paper going like an accordion, and I'm trying to preach. <laughs> so I walked over. I was down here. I walked over and looked at him, finally. And uh, his mother grabbed that paper and shoved it behind the back. She told me afterwards, she said, that's that boy of mine, he's something. I said, tell me about it. <laughs> she said, I told him last week that every time the evangelist raised his hand, he didn't have to run down to the altar, raise his hand first, run down to the altar. He said, if I don't, they never get through. You missed that, but it'll catch you tomorrow. Kids examine. Why? This is an age of examination. Everything is either being weighed, dissected, and there's nothing wrong with examination if you're examining the right thing. But I'll tell you what always follows examination. This is, this, is a, this is an age when the church people are examining new revelations. They're questioning the old. And reason has taken the place of faith. And, mister, I got news for you. There are revelations beyond our reason. Amen? Just because you've examined it and reasoned it doesn't mean beings with God. Because we walk a life of faith, not of reason. Amen? You take that book, hardly anything in there is reason. It's faith. Abraham left the Ur of the Chaldees. Why? Because God said, get out. He wasn't a volunteer. I'm tired of volunteers. Volunteers will quit on you. But when God whops you, you don't quit. Moses wasn't a volunteer. God whopped him and got him on the backside of the desert. And after 40 years, he came back out. He wasn't half as ready to examine the situation. God said, I want you to lead these people out. He said, dear God, not me. He said, I, <laughs> he said, I can't even talk. 
That's good. When you come to the end of your resources, then faith takes over. Examination. But I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what I see in 53 years. I'll tell you what I have seen follow all of this examination. The next thing that follows that is fragmentation. Never has a church been as fragmented as it is now. You go from one end of this city to the other, and you will find new covenant, lost covenant, found covenant, church of the revelation, the Holy Ghost in us. Hey, 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 every day you see a new one. What is it? It's fragmentation. But I want you to know, mister, never allow anything to lead you out of the fellowship of God's church. Examination, fragmentation, and then the next thing that, that happens, and I see it, polarization. The church has polarized in many areas. We polarized in the area of evangelism. How many, how many students do we have today that are thinking about evangelism? Saving souls. No, we're thinking of physicians. Where do I get the best deal? Are you with me? Where do I get the best deal? I, I travel, you know, 300,000 miles a year, roughly. I'm in hundreds of Assembly of God churches. I see associates. I'm not going to say that. No, I'm not going to say it. They're satisfied. They've arrived. You never arrive. But I'm going to tell you something. We have polarized in the area of holiness living. I'm going to tell you in 53 years the words that I've seen go out of our preaching vocabulary. You want to hear them? Hellfire. Nobody touches hellfire. If you did, ha, ha, you'd have another fragmentation. Hey, man, hey, 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 don't talk about hell. Talk about hurting. I'm forever blowing bubbles. Let's talk about that. Hey, you asked for it. <laughs> because you have said, why? I'll tell you why. When the fear of hell goes out of us, something takes its place. Lethargy, apathy, don't care. But after revolution, there's examination, Fragmentation, polarization, and after that comes revolution. I pray for you. I pray for you young men that will be graduating and young women that will be graduating here in a few weeks. I pray for you. I wish I could wrap my arms around you and help you and, and put you where I believe God wants you, where he wants you. Let me, let me go back to the words that we've lost out of our vocabulary, hellfire. We've lost the awe of hell. Another word, righteousness. I remember when I started out to preach. Of course, we only had two messages, the cross and the coming. 
And I got news for you, mister. God is still saying to this generation, I'll meet you at the cross or the meeting's off. He's still saying that. The cross is still the central core. of our preaching. Righteousness, we used to hear great ser sermons, are the righteousness of God. Be righteous, do righteous. You don't hear that anymore. Another word, holiness. You don't hear the word holiness anymore. It's gone out of our vocabulary. You see, we've left out so many words, that's why we can preach in 30 minutes. I used to go and hear Charles S. Price preach. You know how long he preached? Two and a half hours. P.C. Nelson used to hold his spellbound for two hours. Where in the name of God we got this 30 minutes stuff? I don't know. But I do thank God that some men, when they preach, it's only worth 30 minutes. Boy, I'm, I'm wired up this morning. I'm going to tell you one thing. I don't have to preach to you. I'm not looking for a place to preach. After 53 years, I still turn down 20 calls for every one I accept. You tell me about it. Okay. I don't know how I got into all of that. That's free. You don't pay me for that. You know what? We're living right now in a day when world plans have gone awry, when, when no system seems to work. But I've got news for you, mister. I think we need to quit thinking about those plans Let's think a little more about the plan of God. Amen? What does he have planned for this world? I don't think it's a question of, of, of who we are. You know, everybody today is saying, oh, you need to find out your true self. I found that out when I got saved. Amen? I didn't have to go to a seminar to find out who I am. I know who I am. I'm a sinner. Saved by grace. Amen? Called of God. Sent to the ends of the earth. And I'm not just whistling Dixie. I have proven that. When you have built either directly or indirectly 3,000 churches somewhere in this world, you come back and tell me about it. When you have built 14 Bible schools somewhere in this world, in a college somewhere in this world, when you have done that, I want you to come back and tell me about it. But I am here to tell you this morning that you can do the same thing if you don't waste your life. If you don't spend your time saying, why? Why? Then go to hell. Why? I don't know. Holiness is a word you don't use here anymore. You don't hear the word sanctification at all. But a lot of our problem is we are not sanctified. We don't believe in sanctification. Buddy, that book is full of it. Amen? Holiness, righteousness. Sanctification. And I'll tell you another word we're not hearing anymore. Repentance. We're hearing, oh, come now, with your hurt in the Lord, I'll help you. He'll help you if you ask forgiveness and if you repent. He won't touch you until you repent. I'm not concerned about who I am. I'm concerned about I want to know who he is. 
then I'm in business. Let me read you the scripture. Jeremiah, don't turn to it, please. Jeremiah 18, 1 to 6, the word which came to Jeremiah from his last seminar You're a bunch of heretics. The word which came to Jeremiah from his professor. Watch it. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Woo! Anytime he wants to talk to me, I'm open. Amen. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, every time you hear, and the word of the Lord, and the word was preached, and the word was blessed, How have we allowed so many other words to come in and take the place of the word we need? The word of the Lord. And he'll give it to you. Which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise! Get up off of your blessed assurance. Arise! And go down to New Covenant Assembly where they have a special on this week. They will anoint you with scented, colored, blue or green or red anointing oil, whichever you prefer. You never get healed, but you smell good. No, arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will cause thee. I will cause thee to hear my word. Then I said, God, you're kidding. I'm going to First Assembly. If there's one thing you find in the book, it's obedience. And as I tell people, you can sing these praises we're singing in our churches now, off the wall till your eyes fall out. But for every praise, there must be accompanied an obedience. Amen? Just to praise him is not enough. Okay, I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work. Amen? I'm not a product really Christ-wise of my mother or of a college. I am a product of the master potter. Amen? The master lover of souls. See, we can teach you many things, but there's one thing you can't teach a person. You can teach them music, medicine, graduate, beautiful musicians, great doctors, great surgeons, great scientists, great engineers. You can teach them that. But the one thing nobody can teach you is how to love a soul. You've got to come in contact with a master, lover of souls, and then you love souls. Amen? 
and your ability to win souls is only in relationship to your the master lover of souls. Are you with me? When I was a, a student in Paris, oh, I did go to school, you know. They had to burn a school the first one in the schoolhouse down to get me out of third grade. I loved it. Stayed there three years in third grade. I told a teacher when I passed the fourth, I said, I love you. I wish you were smart enough to teach me in the fourth grade. But anyway, I did go to school. Hey, <laughs> I had a student come to me. He's going to quit my class, which is okay. I said, why? He said, because you can't teach. I said, that's not our problem. You can't learn. <laughs> hey, 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 oh, I love it. He made my day. <laughs> can't God help us. But I was a student at the University of Paris at the Sorbonne. I took five class hours of French a day for one solid year for you poor, tired students that think you are got five hours a day of the same thing. I scratched my head in the subjunctive boot, split my infinitives, and left my participles dangling 10 miles in the air. But I learned it. Amen? Not because I was smart, but because he loved me enough. He knew I needed it. But I lived in Paris about three doors from a prodigy of the great artist Picasso. This man since has become a great artist in his own right. In the evening sometimes, I would go down to his studio to watch him work. I loved it. I got a little bit of artist in me. I, I would love to be an artist. I'd love to paint. I was born to love nice things, wound up a holy roller preacher, so I'm going to hang in there. Hey, 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 because it's better. It's better. I'm rich, you see. I'm rich. Not in houses and lands, but I serve him who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And I kept seeing in a little case that he had, I saw all these precious stones. He had a ruby, I mean large stones, they must have cost a fortune. He had a large ruby, he had an amethyst, uh, he had garnet, he had, he had a diamond, a large diamond, maybe a carrot, two carrots. And I... I, I looked at those stones, and I thought, well, that's just a collection he has. So one night, I got up enough courage to ask him what those gems were, those stones. And he said, oh, Mr. Greenaway, he said, you know, every good artist has to have those. And I said, why, for security? Oh, no. No, he said. He said, an artist can paint a blue sky so long that suddenly he loses his sense of true blue. He said we paint red until we become jaded and we lose our sense of, of the true color of red. And he said, when we lose and we become jaded, every once in a while, a good artist has to go back to the gem case and pick out a stone and put it by your easel. And then you begin to mix your paints until you have come back to the true color. 
Let me tell you something. When we become jaded in our religious experience with God, you, when, when nothing seems right and you got 10,000 questions, nothing seems right. Like the artist, we have to go back to the chief cornerstone who has never lost his brilliance. Amen. He has never lost his power. Amen. And go back and stay with him until the jadedness leaves you. Amen. Until you. Well, anyway, I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels and the vessel that he made of clay. And the vessel that Jimmy Swaggart's college made, huh? the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made, he wrought, he made, Let's get back to the rock. Amen. He wrought. He made it again another vessel as seemed good to Oral Roberts. No, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord, here we have it again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Well, house of Israel, cannot I do with you? As this potter saith the Lord, Behold, as a clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. Okay? There is number one thing you've got to remember. The potter is still in command. Amen? He who made us, amen, is still in command. He hath chosen us. Have you ever been to a potter's house in India? In the Middle East, I've been in many of them which are still more like the potter's house of Jeremiah than we have in our modern-day America. But you go into the potter's house, you realize when you walk in, there is a hunk of clay, dirty-looking stuff, full of stone. It's not, you, you say, hey, man, that can't be a beautiful vessel. In Greece, I think I've seen more of it than anywhere else in Greece. But I got news for you. One day we came to him just as a hunk of no good, dirty, And our first stop at the potter's house was the mourner's bench. Where the potter took a look at us and said, My father, where did that come from? When I walked into the master potter's house one day, God must have said that. What? I was dirty, unclean, full of the devil. Could he make a vessel out of me? Yeah. I couldn't do it myself. I don't care how much you try to do for yourself. 
There is no cleansing virtue in any of us. It's only in him, the master potter. And when I was plunked down in the master potter's house, I thank God that the master potter had an image of me. He knew what he wanted me to be. God knows what he wants you to be. Amen? Don't blow it by saying, why? Why? Why does that happen? Why did I don't know why it happened. But I know why he saved me. Why he called me. Because he is the master. He needs a clay. He took me. God have mercy. He couldn't have reached down any further, but he took me. And he had an image of what Greenaway would be. And I'm glad. I'm glad that I didn't grow up in your generation because we didn't have so many wives. We were just so glad God saved us, filled us with the Holy Ghost that we would have gone to hell and back and still had the victory. Nothing moved us. And the first thing I learned about the master potter who took me was that he was in control. I wasn't. I, I, I didn't have control. He did. What was the image that God had of me? Oh, he had an image of me as a smart aleck preacher. As a, a great healing evangelist. Half of you have already made up your mind before God got to you. What you want to do? I'm going to tell you something, mister. If you, now, I better not say that. Did God see me as some sleek rabbit somewhere? I'll tell you how he saw me in Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Amen? That's how he saw me. The moment the clay was chosen by the potter, it was now at the will and the command of the potter. Clay was helpless to do anything on its own. And the process, I have watched them come in with the clay. I have watched them come in with the clay, and they have a big iron table, and they take this clay and they whop it. Pick it up and whop it again. So I said, why do they whop it? I couldn't see any sense in whop. They said, that's to get all of the bubbles out of it. Whop, get all the hot air out of it, whop. Because those bubbles, if they stay in there, when this piece of clay gets in the oven, in the fire, they'll burst and destroy the vessel. Whop! That's what God's doing to some of us. He's whopping you <laughs> to get the hot air out of you. Because God knows when he puts you in the fire, you're going to pop. And you'll be another statistic. 